morning. How are we doing? It's good to see you all. Welcome back to Grace Bible. If you came this morning hoping or expecting to see Pastor Roy, um, he'll be back uh, with us next week. They're returning from vacation, I think, right now. So be praying for them today as they journey back from their, their stay in Florida. Um, last week, we were, um, if you were here, in Genesis chapter 42. If you're here for the first time ever, welcome. If you're here for the first time in a long time, it's good to see you again. This summer, we have been looking at the life of Joseph. So we've been primarily working our way through the latter part of the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. We started several weeks back. Pastor Roy kicked this, kicked this off with Genesis 37, and uh, now we're, we're about, I, I suppose, about halfway through, maybe a little further along than that, Genesis 43. So a couple weeks back, Joseph was in prison because he didn't do anything wrong, didn't steal anything, didn't hurt anybody. He was living a, a life of integrity, um, was doing well, but he, he just refused the advances of this, of this one particular woman who belonged to Potiphar, Potiphar's wife. She couldn't stand that. She was irritated and overwhelmed with, with, with anger, and so she concocts this story that he tried to take advantage of her, and he was ultimately placed in prison. Several years after the fact, he would be miraculously released from prison due to his ability to interpret dreams. He then is elevated by Pharaoh, probably the most powerful person in the entire world at that time, is elevated to like the number two guy in all of Egypt. And Joseph is able to, because of this dream that he interprets, he's able to, um, or he's actually given the responsibility of, of, of saving food stores and distributing food stores during a season of famine. There are seven years of famine, and that causes Jacob to send Joseph's other brothers to Egypt to purchase food. So that's, that's Genesis 42. And we, we, we talked about um, the, the relationship that, that you know, existed between those brothers and, and what transpired. When, when Joseph sees his brothers for the first time, they, they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them and what transpired. So at the end of that chapter, uh, Joseph said, hey, I'm, I'm going to send you back to your father. You're going to go back. You're going to bring back your younger brother, your youngest brother, Benjamin. He kept Simeon with him in Egypt. And he said, you come back and bring Benjamin with you. And he said, don't bother coming back without Benjamin. It's, it's a test. We talked about tests and trials and things of that nature. And so the, the brothers get back. We'll look at these verses here in just a moment. They tell their father Jacob about, about this man. They call him the man. They, again, they don't know it's Joseph. They, they, just, they assume that Joseph's dead. They tell them about the man in Egypt that they saw, um, and, and, and they discovered that the money that they originally had in their bags for food, they thought that because they were given food, they thought that money was taken from them, but they open up their sacks, and the money is there, and so they're really worked up and concerned, and their father Jacob is concerned. And so what we're going to look at today in chapter 43 is sort of the culmination of, of, of all of that. And I got to say from the get-go, you guys are going to have to give me some, some grace. So we've got, we've got three, actually four individuals that we're going to look at this morning, and all of their names start with the letter J. And so I promise you from the get-go, I'm probably going to mess that up. And so I hope and pray that I don't confuse that for you. So we're going to look, we're going to talk about a Jacob, a Judah, a Joseph, and then a Jesus. Um, and so if, if I apply one of those names to somebody who that name doesn't belong to, if you're following along, tracking along with me in your Bible, I, I do hope and pray that it will, it will make sense for you. I love this chapter. It's, it's probably not one of the more familiar chapters concerning the life of Joseph, but I love it because everything that we're going to read is going to, I hope, will clearly point us forward to Jesus. Some of the things we're going to look at may seem strange or unusual to us, um, but, but, I, but I pray that the Holy Spirit will help us to understand that, that these things, these events in this particular culture are absolutely pointing ahead to Jesus Christ. And I hope that I can make that clear for us here this morning by the, hope, the help of the Holy Spirit. This morning I've got, I've got four points from the text that I want to share with you. Four points of observation. The first is this. Let's talk about the necessity of brave sacrifice. 
the necessity of brave sacrifice. Shelby just read for us um, a few moments ago the first 14 verses of chapter 43. And in verse 1, we're told that the, the famine was severe in the land. So already, Jacob had dispatched his, his boys the first time to go to Egypt to get food. They, they bring that food back along with the money, and they're, they're surprised by that. And they, they, they eat from that grain for an undisclosed period of time, and now things have become progressively worse. The idea here with the word severe is this is a desperate time. It, that, that perhaps they have animals that, that, that are dying. They're, they're, they're growing thin due to the famine. They're not able to grow food. There's no rain. And so Jacob, the patriarch, is becoming increasingly concerned. And so he says to his boys, hey, you got to get up, go again, and buy us a little food. And then the brothers are like, his sons are like, hey, we can't do that. Remember, we told you that in order for us to return, we were going to have to take Benjamin. And, and, and Jacob doesn't want to do that. And so I think it begs the question, why, why doesn't Jacob want to do that? What, you know, he needs to feed his family. He can see that, that the situation in front of his eyes is a desperate one. So why doesn't Jacob want to send them back with his youngest, Benjamin? I think if, if we read between the lines, we can see for, for quite some time, Jacob has probably had um, some questions and, and some concerns surrounding his sons. Let's turn back a page, perhaps, in your Bibles. It's one page of mine. Go back to Genesis chapter 42, and let's look at verse 4. This has been an ordeal for quite some time for Jacob. Genesis 42.4, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother. This is the first voyage with his brothers when he sent them to get food from Egypt. For he feared that harm might happen to him there. Now, Benjamin, at this time, like I, I'm saying boys and sons, none of these brothers are, are adolescents. None of them are teenagers. They're all in their mid-20s to 40s and 50s. These are, these are grown Men. And so when the text says that Jacob feared that harm might happen to Benjamin, it's not because Benjamin can't handle himself. His concern is that his older brothers may do something to him. I think Jacob, all the way back, after, after Joseph's brothers originally um, put him in the pit and thought about leaving him for dead and then ultimately sold him into slavery and they go back home and they've concocted that, that silly story about you know, with the, with the coat of many colors that they had dipped in, in goat's blood, and hey, an animal overtook Joseph. I think, I think Joseph probably, I mean, uh, there, I did it that J, for the first time. I think Jacob um, probably even back then was going, yeah, I don't know about that. I'm not, I'm not sure. I've got some questions. And so he, he's concerned. If I send Benjamin with these brothers, what's going to happen? Look at um, same chapter, chapter 42. Let's look at verse 35. They've just returned. The brothers are, the sons are reporting to their father everything that they've heard, everything that they experienced the first time in Egypt. Verse 35, as they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob's, Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is, Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. And then Reuben, he's one of the older boys, said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My, sh my son shall not go down with you, for this brother is dead and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. So Reuben steps up initially and has this, you know, hey, take my son's lives if, 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 if we're not able to, to bring Benjamin and Simeon back safely. And Jacob's initial response to that is, is absolutely no. No, Benjamin stays here. But things have gotten worse and worse and worse. And we're, after, after Jacob says, okay, you guys got to go get food. And they're like, we can't go. We, can't, we told you we can't go. Judah now enters um, the conversation. And Judah says, look, we could have gone 
there and come back and gone again and come back multiple times over had you just released to us Benjamin when we told you originally what, what the situation was, but you won't let us go. And then fine, this is why I'm calling this, this first point the necessity of, of brave sacrifice. Here, look at verse 9 in chapter 43. Judah is pleading with his father. Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge or a guarantee of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Judah puts himself, makes himself a, um, a, a sacrifice, a willing sacrifice in order to bring, to convince Jacob to, uh, to, send, to send Benjamin. Let's talk just real briefly about, about the life of, of Judah. Um, his story in the next chapter will, will, will kind of crescendo a little bit. But earlier in, in the narrative, Genesis chapter 37, when when the brothers see J Joseph coming from a distance to check on them, their, their hearts are enraged. They're, they're full of jealousy and pride concerning Joseph. And they put him in the pit. And they, they think at first, like I said a moment ago, that their, their, their thoughts are at first to kill him. And then they're like, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that. that. That's too much. And they sit down and they have lunch. And they're going back and forth about what to do. And it's Judah who originally comes up with the idea of selling Joseph into slavery. Not a good dude at first. Let's just sell him into slavery. He looks out over the horizon. There's a band of Ishmaelite traders coming, and Judah says, let's sell him into slavery. And then in the next chapter, Genesis chapter 38, Genesis chapter 38 is probably one of the hardest chapters in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is full of hard, difficult chapters to, to, to wade through. There, there is not, and there never will be, a vacation Bible school lesson over Genesis 38. It's that hard. It's that troubling. So in Genesis chapter 38, um, Judah has, has he, he's married, he has these three sons, Er, E-R, Onan, and Shelah. Er gets married to this woman named Tamar. And if you know the story, I'm not going to go into all the nitty-gritty because it's probably not even for like this morning in mixed company. It's Read it on your own. Er gets married to Tamar. They have a child. Er dies. So it, it is the responsibility for the next of kin to marry that woman and to, to, to care for her and to take her in and her children and so forth. So Judah gives his second son, Onan, to Tamar. Onan dies. <laughs> and so now there's a third boy. And he's young, though. He's not, he's not of marrying age yet. And Judah tells Tamar, hey, I pledge Shelah to you, but you're going to have to wait. Go back to your father's house. Be a widow there. And when Shelah grows up, when he's of marrying age, then I pledge Shelah to you. Okay, a few years go by, Shelah grows up, Judah looks at Shelah, he looks at Tamar, and he says, yeah, I changed my mind. <laughs> I'm not, I, I know I pledged him to you, I know I promised this to you, but I've changed my mind, I'm not going to give Shelah to you. So Tamar, this is where it gets a little, if it's a little weird, she disguises herself and goes into the city one night and tricks Judah into sleeping with her. She becomes pregnant. And has two, bears him two twin boys. So his life, Judah's life, is, has been marked by um, cruelty. It's been marked by indiscretion, by dishonesty. But now we find him in this chapter stepping up and making himself the pledge. He's making himself the guarantee of Benjamin's life. And he says to his father, Jacob, look, the situation is desperate. You don't want to send us back. But if we go back empty-handed without, without Benjamin, then the man in Egypt is not going to see us. He's not going to give us money. He's probably just going to throw us into prison. So I make myself the guarantee. He does what Reuben didn't refuse to do. Reuben said, hey, you can, have my, you can kill my boys. And Jacob says, that's silly. 
I make my own life the pledge. That is a, and we don't, we don't talk or think about this enough, but that is, an, that is a hallmark of biblical Christianity. A, a, a willingness to make, to, to, to live courageously. A willingness to, for, for us to, to sacrifice everything for the glory of our, of our God. To lay ourselves down for the glory of our King. It is a, it is a bedrock foundational element of biblical New Testament Christianity. I have a picture of, of some, I'm going to talk about a couple of missionary couples. I love missions. I love missionaries. Here's the first couple. Um, that's Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. Some of you know the story of, of, of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. Jim Elliot was a college student in the late 40s, early 50s at Wheaton University. And, and he, he belonged to, to the upper crust of, of society. He was supposed to be a lawyer or, or, or become a politician. But while he is at university, he begins to really study the scriptures for himself. He begins to own his faith. And, and he really, be, as he studies the scriptures, um, he comes to Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, where Jesus said, if anyone would save his life, he will lose it. But if anyone will, will lose his life for my sake, he will find it. And that, that verse just, just covers, it, it just gets all over him. And he, he devotes his life to, to the nations. And he falls in love with this young lady. They, they courted one another for quite some time. And they had this, this, this tumultuous uh, relationship. But when they both surrender all to Jesus, that they, they fall um, deeper in love with each other. And, and, and Jim, in 1949, in his journal, while he was a college student, he famously penned this little, this little phrase, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. So when they graduate from Wheaton College, along with four of his friends and some of their wives and some of their children, they fly to Ecuador to be missionaries amongst one of the most hostile people groups the world had ever known, the Aka people in Ecuador in the Amazonian rainforest. And, and, and there they try to make contact with the Aka people. One of the individuals, um, this guy named uh, Nate, Nate Saint, was, was a pilot. And so they would fly overhead and they would drop little care packages down. And they, would, they had a loudspeaker and they were trying to, to, to say things and, and let these people know that they were coming in and, and, and friendly terms to them. And one day they decided to land on a beachhead. And for a few hours they, they, they conversed and they talked with these with, with these violent peoples, and then out of nowhere, all of a sudden things, the, the, the barometer of the situation changed dramatically, and, and Jim Elliott, along with four of his missionary companions, were speared to death on the beach, laid his life down. But that's not where the story ends. Sometime after they were speared to death, Elizabeth Elliott, along with the child that they shared together, Valerie, and some other women, some other missionaries, returned to that very place and picked up the work right where their husbands had left off. And they, made, they, they were able to reach the Aka people. And they, they, made, they made disciples of them. The man who killed Jim Elliott became a believer and became like a spiritual father to, to Jim's uh, daughter and, and to other children who belonged to those, to those missionaries. This is what happens when we will lay our lives down in brave sacrifice. To our King, God will use our lives for His glory. This is what we would expect. What, what Judah is saying, and what we've seen demonstrated in the lives of other brave men and women, other brave Christians, this is what we would expect to see in a righteous ruler. Someone who will step up and lay his or her life down for the good of others and for the glory of his or her King. That's what we would hope to see in a righteous ruler. About 800 years after this story, after the story of Judah, one of Judah's descendants was a man named David. We know him as King David. David failed at this. David, we're told in the scriptures, there was, it was springtime when the kings were supposed to go off to war, and David remained at home. And while he's at home and his men are off fighting these battles against the Philistines and all of the ites, David is out on his rooftop walking around, and he sees a woman. He spies a woman taking a bath. And it's always, guys, it's always the second look that kills, right? He sees her. He turns away. He looks again. And then he calls for her to be brought to him, and he lays with her, and she becomes pregnant. And so all of a sudden, there's this crisis that has to be corrected. And so David, out of his flesh, starts to figure out a way to maneuver and to manipulate things to suit him and to satisfy him. 
And so he, making a long story short, ultimately David, when he should have laid his life down, when he should have been a sacrifice amongst his men on the battlefield, David concocts or, 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 or uh, undertakes this plan to have Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, sacrificed on the battlefield. David failed when it came to serving as a sacrifice. But about a thousand years after David lived, almost 2,000 years after Judah lived, another of Judah's descendants would come. And we know him as the Lion of Judah, Jesus, who would demonstrate for us perfectly what it looks like to be a sacrifice, what it looks like to, to make yourself the guarantee, to make yourself the pledge so that others may live. Here's what's really cool, and I promise I've got other points that I've got to get to. I didn't think this first one was going to take so long. The, the, if, if you follow from Judah to the line of Jesus, the individual, the son that God uses to get us from Judah to Jesus is not Shelah, the son that Judah originally refused to give to Tamar. This is, what, this is, this is how good our God is. This, is. this is the God of redemption that we serve. It's Perez, the son that Judah had with Tamar indiscreetly. That's how God redeems things. God, God is redeeming a family and will ultimately bring about his, the, the birth of his son, God the son, through the line of Perez. Pretty awesome. Next point. Let's talk about the requirement of trust and faith. Judah makes his pledge. He makes himself a guarantee. Look at verse 11 of chapter 43. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother. Then arise, go again to the man. And now verse 14. Verse 14 is a really important verse in this chapter. Verse 14 is like a benediction or a, or a blessing that, that, that Jacob speaks. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your other brother Benjamin. And as for me, if I'm bereaved, I am bereaved. And when we began this, this series over the life of Joseph several weeks back, um, Pastor Roy talked quite a bit about, about the life of, of, of Jacob. Jacob's life, um, the, the majority of Jacob's life was marked by uh, self-centeredness, it, it, it was littered with, with corrupt dealings with man and with the Lord. When, when, from, from almost the beginning of his life, uh, Jacob, Jake, Jacob struggled with his brother Esau. He deceived his father Isaac. He, he, he wrestled and struggled with, with, against his father-in-law Laban. And then, then kind of midway through his life, he, he wrestles with, with the Lord. And now Jacob is, is, is advanced in years. He finally gets to the land of Canaan. And before Jacob gets to this place. His wife, his, he's got a couple of wives and several concubines. So, that, like the, the red, this man's life is littered with red flags. And so, before he gets to the place where he's ultimately going to live, um, his, his beloved wife Rachel dies. His father Isaac dies. He he gets to this place and he learns from his boys that his beloved son um, Joseph has died. And now he's advanced in years, and everybody's hungry. And what I what I find in this chapter is God saying to Jacob, "I'm not done with you." You may be old, there may have been some, some hardships, some challenges that you faced in life. You may have a whole bunch of failures in the rearview mirror, but I feel like God is screaming off of the page, Jacob, I'm not done with you. And here's what I want to say to us this morning. There may be some men in the room. There are some, some older men in the room, some mature men in this room, and maybe you've had some struggles, some stuff in your life. And I think what God is saying to all of us, men and women included this morning, I'm not done with you. Don't, don't, do not just assume that the, the, that the trajectory of your life, Christian, is all about you just kind of just, 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 just flipping through the channels and just chilling and just, and just punching it on autopilot until you die. I've got a plan for you. I've got something for you. There's more for you if you'll just trust me. So we come to this verse. And Jacob eventually just resigns to the fact that he's going to have to send Benjamin. And so he trusts. He 
places his faith not in his sons, not, not in Judah, but ultimately in the Lord. He says in verse 14, May God Almighty grant you mercy, Judah and Reuben and the rest of my sons. May God Almighty, his faith and his trust is in God. Let's pause here for just a second. Let's talk about, about God for just a moment. Let's talk about the name of God. Some of you, I'm sure, have, have done some studies. There are some wonderful ones out there, some studies, some books that have been written on the names of God. We believe, this is basic Christianity 101, we believe that we serve, um, that, there, that there is one God of the universe who has eternally existed in three distinct persons. But when we refer to that one God, the Godhead, God in, in the scriptures uses different names to reveal himself to us. And those different, it's not because he's got multiple personalities or, or he's undecided or, or different moods, but those different names reveal different aspects of his, of his character to us. So in the Old Testament, we have the divine name, the proper name of God, Yahweh. Whenever you're reading your Bible in the Old Testament and you see the word Lord in all capital letters, that's what we call the tetragrammaton, Yahweh. Um, that, that is the, the, the most popular name for God in the Bible. It's almost 7,000 times in the Old Testament you'll find the word Yahweh. If you ever see in the Old Testament, capital L, but then lowercase O-R and D, that's the, the name Adonai, which means Lord or Master. And then there's the name Elohim that appears a lot. Whenever you read your Bible and you just see the word God or the name God by itself, that's probably Elohim. That's in the beginning. This is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, Elohim. That is plural. Elohim is plural, and so it just kind of points us back to the fact that God is triune, that he is three in one. It, it, it means the, the, the powerful God, the, 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 the self-sufficient God, the, the creator God. And then there are times in the Bible when we see the singular form of Elohim, El, connected to another Hebrew word. Um, Genesis chapter 14, um, El Elyon, God most high. Genesis chapter 16, El Roy, the God who sees me. That's a wonderful story. You should check that out. Um, Hagar, which was uh, Sarah's maidservant who uh, Abraham um, kind of got in a hurry with God. We see the fulfillment of her story as she calls upon El Roy, the God who sees me. And then in this passage, Genesis 43, we come to God Almighty. That is El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Some of you may remember um, the 1982 song by Amy Grant, El Shaddai. El Shaddai, El Shaddai. <laughs> Maybe check it out. Spotify it. All right. Some of you are looking at me like I just lost my mind. Uh, El Shaddai, it means God Almighty, the, 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 the God of power, the God of might. There are some people, some scholars believe that that word Shaddai is not Hebrew, but it's this, this, this word that belongs to an Akkadian language that means not God of might, but God of the mountain. Caroline, just a few moments ago, sang for us um, about, uh, uh, about the mountain, that God is higher than, than the mountains that we face. And I think that that truth is conveyed here in, in, in this name for the Lord, El Shaddai, God of the mountain. The first time th this, this El Shaddai only appears seven times in the Old Testament, and five of those occurrences are in the book of Genesis. The first time that God reveals himself as El Shaddai, God Almighty, or God of the mountain, is in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, when God seals his covenant with Abraham. And God says to Abraham, I, I am God Almighty. You can trust me. And Abraham was facing an impossible situation. Abraham was old. He was 99 years of age. And God says, hey, you've never had children. Your wife's never been able to bear children, but you're going to have a son. And that son is going to be the beginning of a blessed nation. And then a few years after, like 15 years after that son, Isaac, is born, God would tell Abraham, hey, now you're going to have to trust me at a deeper, a deeper level because I'm going to, you're, going to, you're going to sacrifice your son to me. You're going to lay your, your son down. Where, where did that take place? On a mountain, Mount Moriah, that Abraham would have to ascend. And he would have to learn to trust El Shaddai, God of the mountain on Mount Moriah. And now Jacob is facing for himself. And, and, and Abraham is Jacob's uh, grandfather. He's heard that story about Abraham and Isaac probably thousands of times and over the course of his life. 
And now he is faced with his own impossible situation. I've got to send back Benjamin. Joseph has already been taken from me. I don't know about Simeon. I don't know if I can trust these boys about what they're saying about Benjamin and being held captive for ransom in this place. I don't, I don't know, but I'm going to trust God. And he calls upon the name of God, El Shaddai. How do we know if we are truly walking by faith and trusting the Lord like we're supposed to? If we have surrendered all. You, you may wonder, like, am I, okay, am I doing that? Is, is my life marked by trust and faith like these Old Testament heroes, like the saints of the Old Testament? Is that true of me because my situations, my circumstances are much different Am, am, am I doing that? Have you placed your full surrender in the Lord? That's how you'll know. I got another picture I want to share with you. Uh, cameras were not around when these guys lived. <laughs> this is Adoniram and Ann Judson, another missionary couple. Um, Adon, Adoniram Judson was born in, in 1788, died in 1850. Adoniram Judson was a part of the movement that kicked off worldwide, worldwide missions. There was another guy a little bit older than him named William Carey that kind of got the whole thing going in the United Kingdom. Adoniram Judson was, was an American, and so he was one of the first guys, one of the first pastors and missionaries who went cross-culturally to other places to take the gospel amongst the unreached. Adoniram Judson fell in love with this woman named Anne. He wanted to marry Anne and take her with him to Burma, present-day Myanmar. But uh, Adoniram Judson had to have the blessing of, his fa of her father first. And so Adoniram Judson wrote her father a letter asking for her hand in marriage. And I want to read you a portion of that letter. I've shared this with churches before. And as a father of three girls, this, this always floors me. Adoniram Judson wrote, I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world, whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life, whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake, man, this gets me, for the sake of him who left hev his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God, can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamations of praise which shall resound to her Savior from heathens saved through her means, from eternal woe and despair. Can you imagine dads, <laughs> a young man asking for your daughter's hand in marriage and telling you something like that? <laughs> Mr. Hasseltine was a man of surrender. He said, yes. And these folks, they leave America. They sell to India. Ultimately, they end up in Burma. And it wasn't too long after they arrived there. Anne became pregnant. She suffered a miscarriage. She eventually would die in the field due to sickness. Adoniram Judson, a few years later, would, would marry again. That wife would have children who would die in the field, some due to miscarriage, others due to sickness. That second wife died. And so some people may say, like, what was that all? Like, what was the point of all that? Why not just stay in America and build a house and, and, and start a life and do all those things? Was it worth it? After 12 years in Burma, Adoniram Judson only had 18 converts. And I'm sure he had his detractors. I'm sure people back stateside were laughing and going like, what a waste of a life, of lives. At the time of his death, there were 100 churches in Burma and about 12,000 converts. And today, because he said yes and his wife said yes and her father-in-law said yes, there are almost 3 million believers in Jesus Christ in Burma. Are you surrendered? Jacob was fully surrendered. He said, may God Almighty grant you mercy. And at the end of that benediction, he said, if I am bereaved, if I am childless, I am 
childless. It's similar to what Queen Esther said in Esther chapter 4. If I perish, I perish. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, Horatio Spadford wrote, it is well with my soul. Is that your story this morning? Are you fully surrendered to the Lord? Your circumstances may look different, but God will use you if you'll surrender all to him. All right, next, we've got to pick up the pace. Let's talk thirdly about the treasure for anxious hearts. The boys leave. They take the present with them. Verse 16, uh, when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, bring the men in, into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready for the men. Uh, are, the men are, are to dine with me at noon. And the, and the man did just as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it, it, it is because of the money which, we, um, which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we were brought in so that, we may, so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. They were terrified. They were afraid. When these men eventually come back to Egypt, they're filled. The Hebrew is like, when it says that they're terrified in verse 18, it means to be filled with terror. I mean, they're just assured at this point that their lives are over. They're hoping just to go to the storehouse and just to kind of settle up. Here's the money. We don't, we're not sure how it got back to us, but, but, but here's the money. We need food. Okay, uh, here, here's Benjamin. Look at Benjamin. Give us Simeon, and we'll be on our way. That's all they were hoping for. That's all that they expected, but now they find themselves at Joseph's house, and they're filled with terror, and they're so freaked out. And I know some of us here this morning deal with anxiety. They're so freaked out that they start to panic about the donkeys, and that's what un, unfettered and unrestrained fear will do for us. It will cause us to fixate and worry about things rather than to see reality rightly. And so they come before this steward and they've got this plan. They've got a speech concocted about what, what they're going to say. They, they, they've justified it in their minds. They're going to try to make sense to the steward, Joseph Stewart, about all that's happened. And I love the steward's response. Look at verse 19. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house. And he said, oh, my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. And when we came to the lodging place, this is their story. We opened our sacks and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us. And we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put the money in our sacks. And he, the steward, replied, peace to you. Do not be afraid. Here's his response. The steward's response, peace to you, do not be, be afraid. You're going to see, this is an Egyptian steward, but clearly Joseph has been, do, has been doing some witnessing in his house. This steward, this Egyptian steward who worships a pantheon, a multitude of gods, has heard about the one true God, Elohim, from Joseph. And the steward's response to these anxiety-riddled brothers of Joseph's is peace to you. That word peace is, of course, the Hebrew word shalom. And, and, and the Hebrew understanding of peace is much different from our Western modern day understanding of peace. When you and I talk about peace, we talk about peace from things. We want peace from war. We want peace from um, arguments. We, we want peace from conflict. But the, the Hebrew understanding of shalom is an all-encompassing peace. It's not peace from things, but it's peace in things. It's peace in war. It's peace in conflict. It's peace in the midst of turmoil. And so the, 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 the steward says, Shalom, he speaks Hebrew to them. And then he says this, this is so interesting. Your God, and it's the word Elohim that we talked about a few moments ago. Your God and the God of your father, Elohim of your father, Jacob, has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. And then he brought Simeon out to them. Now, how do we, how do we make sense of that? Because we're told in the previous chapter, chapter 42, verse 25, that Joseph instructed it, maybe not this steward, but one of his stewards to replace the money in the sacks. But now we find this steward telling these brothers, hey, your God, the God of your fathers, has put this money in your sacks. God, your God has done this for you. So was it, was it Joseph? Was it the steward? Was it God? And the answer to that question is yes. God did it through Joseph, and through this steward. And that, that, that's the testimony of Scripture, that, that God is doing things for us providentially and sovereignly behind the scenes. We can't see it. We can't appreciate it in the moment oftentimes. But God is doing 
these things. That's what Jesus told the demon-possessed man from the, from the garrisons that he had just healed. The, the, after he heals him, the demon-possessed man wants to go with Jesus. And he says, no, 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 no. You go home and you tell everybody, your, your friends, your family, everybody, what the Lord has done for you. What sort of treasure this morning? What sort of treasure would bring peace to your anxious heart? We came here this morning, we drove here from different places in Gunner and Solana and Tom Bean and wherever, how, and all of us have different worries and fears and anxieties that are on our hearts. Some of us, we have financial worries. Some of us, we have relationship struggles. We've got things that we're dealing with with our spouse. Some of us, are like we're facing something at work tomorrow morning that's going to be right there meeting a smack dab in the face when we walk through the office door. What sort of peace, would, what sort of treasure would, would, bring, would, would bring peace to your anxious heart? We're told in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, the Apostle Paul says that my God will supply, will, will supply you with at your heart with everything that you need according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. That's how this points to Jesus. The Lord is going to take care of us. He'll meet our needs in Jesus if we'll only trust him. Finally, and I know I've gone over time. I'll, I'll do this quickly. Finally, this morning, let's talk about the astonishing banquet. Here comes Joseph, verse 26. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them. Remember the present that, that Jacob, their father, had loaded up for them? There's probably not much in a, in a land that's, that's riddled by famine, but he takes the best thing that they had, he gives it to the boys, they, ba- they brought into the house to him the present that they had with with them, and they bowed down, they prostrate themselves to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? I love that. Again, they've got this story, and they've got their present, and here comes Joseph, and they bow down. They're paying homage to him. They're putting the present in front of him, much like the wise men presented a, a present to Jesus. And Joseph is unconcerned with that gift. He's more about presents than he is about those presents that they brought to him. And so he quickly inquires of them, about, how are you doing? And again, they're, 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 their hearts are probably still beating in their chest, thinking like, we're going to get punished, we're going to get beaten, we're going to be placed in prison. Like, what, what's he going to say to us? What's he going to do to us? And, and then he has the audacity to ask them about how they're doing. And how's your father doing? This is missing. This sort of hospitality is missing in our day. But oh, that we would rediscover it. You see, Joseph is in Egypt, but Egypt is not in Joseph. Joseph still fears the Lord and he still loves the Lord and that is clearly evidenced in his life. He's, he, could, he could do whatever he wants. He has power. He has authority. He could, he could bring these men down. He could flex on them. But instead, he just gives them grace. He, 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 he makes them the focus rather than himself. There, I think there's something, there's a question there for us to examine at some point today or maybe throughout this week. What about us? Joseph was in Egypt, but Egypt was not in him. What about you when you're on business? You're in Vegas. You're in Austin, you're in Chicago, you're in New York. You're in those places, but are, are those places in you? Maybe you're at book club or you're at, you're at like some soccer gathering, a thing of parents. Maybe you're, just, maybe you're at the booster club meeting, but are those things in you? Like we go to those places, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. Do we go to those places and allow those places to influence and to change us? Or are we being transformed into the image of Jesus? And are we bringing the light of Christ to bear wherever we find ourselves? They said, your servant, our father, is well, but he, he is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother, Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. And then Joseph hurried out, for his heart grew warm, with, uh, warm for his brother, and, and he sought a place to weep. His, his heart is literally liquidated within him. He's warmed to the point where he cannot contain himself. He's overwhelmed. He cries. He weeps for the second time. He did it in chapter 42. Now he's doing it again. And some of you might be like, what's with this guy? I'm wondering, what's with this guy? He's, he's crying over here. Now he's crying over here. Like, man up. And I would tell you that like one of, 
a, a hallmark of godly men is, is, is a man who can weep at the right time over the right things. Joseph wept. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. John wept when he is, when, when John sees a revelation of heaven, he weeps. Paul wept. Some of you know, if you don't know any other scriptures, you know the one in John chapter 11 about Jesus wept. What, what, what would cause you to weep today? I, I know some men that will cry over football games, they'll sports cry. I, I, I've, I've met with some dudes that will, that will cry when they, when they haven't been able to close the deal. But like, are you, would you be willing to reap, weep over the right things, over your brothers and your sisters, your neighbors, your children, souls? Here's how it ends. And he entered his chamber and he wept there and then he washed his face, he gathers himself, he comes out and controlling himself, he said, serve the food. And they served him by himself and, and them, the brothers by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. I'm gonna ask our praise team to come back up. I'm gonna land this plane. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement, astonishment. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but, Gen but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. This is the astonishing table. This is, the, this, is, this is grace that is being unfurled before these brothers that just blows them away. You see, they, they, they come expecting to go to prison, but they get the palace. They come to Egypt expecting the worst, but they ultimately they get the best. And they're, 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 not, they're not beaten down. They're not handcuffed and shackled, but they're brought into the banquet room. And this lavish spread is, is put before them. And they get to enjoy Joseph. They're going to find out in the next chapter who he really is. But right now they're just enjoying and they're just probably shaking their heads. And, and, and in the original Hebrew, like in my Bible, and I'm sure many of your Bibles, it sounds like Joseph orders for food to be taken to them. But I think the original idea in the Hebrew is that Joseph gets down off of his perch and he hands his brothers some food. He gives them more. And they're probably blown away. It reminds me of this, this, this future banqueting table that awaits all of us who are in right relationship with the Father. Song of Solomon, chapter two, verse four, the beloved says that he brought me to the banqueting table and his banner over me is love. One, one day, the sky is gonna be torn in two and, and the trumpet of heaven is, heaven is going to sound. A cry of the archangel will go forth and our, our savior is gonna come back for us. In biblical times, the bridegroom would come at night with his friends to, to, the, to the home of his bride and he would take her away to be with him in this house that he'd been building for her. One day this glorious rapture is gonna come. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna meet the Lord together in the air. We're gonna sit down at his table. Psalm 23 says that that, that, that we will dwell with, with him forever. Goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. He's gonna anoint with our, our head with oil and our cup will run it over and I'll get to eat in the, in the presence of my enemies. We will dine at the banqueting table of heaven. Our, our enemy, Satan, will be vanquished and we'll get to sit down with our, with our bridegroom, Jesus, and dine forever. All, all of these these, these, these weird seating arrangements will be over and done with. We'll get to sit close to our king. Who, 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 does the, who, who is the bridegroom? It's all of those who bowed and surrendered. It's those who said yes to the invitation. It's the broken. It's the crippled. It's the lame. It's the rebel, the stranger who said yes to the invitation to come in. Is that you? Let's pray this morning. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for this story that has been kept and preserved for us. Lord, I thank you for how this story points us to Jesus, for what he's going to do, for how he's going to bring us home to enjoy him forever. And we're told, God, at the end of the story with Joseph that they, that they didn't eat in some like uptight, stuffy fashion, but they, they ate and they drank and they made merry. And it reminds me of the story when, 
when, when David was bringing the ark into Jerusalem for the first time, and he danced and he made merry before the Lord God. When we, we finally get to go home, it's, it's not going to be uptight, but God, we're going to be able to dance and eat and dine with you, and it's going to be beautifully wild for all of eternity for your children. And I pray, God, that, that all of these who are here, gathered here this morning, would know that reality one day, that their hearts would be made right with you through Jesus Christ. Lord, if there's any, any person, man or woman, couple, young man, young woman, who if they don't know you yet, then God, today I pray that they would make today that day, that they would surrender all, that they would go all in with you. If there's, any, if there's anything that we've been holding on to, some, some sin or some fear that's been keeping us at bay from you, then God, I pray that we would confess that and lay that down. Do whatever you long to do in our midst this morning. We love you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. We'll be done.